Hi, welcome to Governance Bites. I'm Mark Benicevic and today I'm very fortunate to spend some time with Kate Venel. Kate, thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you, Mark. I feel really honoured to be part of this series and looking at the previous people you have, I'm, I'm just an exceptional company. So, yeah, I feel very honoured. Uh, and also overly humble because Kate is a chartered member of the Institute of Directors and she sits on a number of boards. She's an independent director on a financial services company, a large financial services company in New Zealand called Lifetime. She is a board trustee of the Auckland Philharmonia, because you've got a passion for music, haven't I do, you? I do, I uh, do. And she's also deputy chair of both Mindful Money and the Diabetes Foundation of Aotearoa. Uh, Kate has worked 14 years in Fitzy 100 company it's this legal in general in the UK. They're a very large, it used to be fire in general and life and health insurer, now they just do life and health and asset management, is yep, that right? Very large asset manager. Yeah, they're the 10th yep. largest asset manager in the mm. world by assets under management, according to Wikipedia. Yeah. Uh, and you had a role, at, well, among your many roles in, in the time there, you were commercial direct, finance director of life insurance, yes. so a very strong life insurance background, yep. and also head of investor relations. Yeah, so that was a role across the group, working with the group CEO and CFO, and formally meeting the large shareholders of the group, which were across America, the United Kingdom, some in Europe as well. It's a very formal process with kind of compliance obligations and it needs to be done in quite a kind of professional way. So that was a really insightful role actually. That yeah. gives us an opportunity to talk about that subject, wh yeah. which is quite unique and I'm yeah. really looking forward yeah. to this. Yeah. So the topic we're going to talk about today mm -hmm. is the board role in promoting the effective shareholder engagement. We'll start with uh, when ownership becomes separated yep. from the board. So mm -hmm. essentially what happens when companies yep. get larger is you get a separation of ownership from management. Yes. Uh, how important is the shareholder's voice in the boardroom and why? Well, it's a great question. And I think we have to start with kind of the Companies Act and companies co co company directed duties, which are to the best interests of the company. And that doesn't always mean in the short term, particularly the best interests of the shareholders. Um, it, it should do in the long run, but in the short term, there are other considerations in you know, debt investors, creditors, employees, and sometimes there are trade offs to be made. So, in terms of the voice of the shareholders, there are probably two broad ways of engaging with shareholders for a large company. The first is with the kind of portfolio managers of a large fund manager and they are considering effectively weighting decisions. Will they increase their shareholding? Will they decrease their shareholding, even sell out completely, or maybe come in for the first time? These meetings are pretty formal. They are not seeking to try to influence how the company is run, at least directly. They are managed through a question and answer process. Those managers often keep their thoughts and their cards quite close to their chest. You might not know whether they're particularly happy or particularly unhappy. You will get a sense of it if the meeting feels relaxed or feels not very relaxed. Um, and then you might find out a few weeks later when you notice that that fund manager's holdings have gone up or even you know, to a, a delightful surprise of a new large fund manager coming in um, for the first time because you've managed a series of meetings and they've gained that confidence. So it's really about management um, giving answers but those answers do have to be managed carefully. They have to be the information that's in the public domain. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yes. you can't be giving information that's not in the public domain. A good fund manager will look for body language signals. You know, is the CEO feeling on top of things or looking on top of things or are they actually looking a bit anxious? <laughs> so there's a lot of kind of hidden messages being transmitted, but it is that formal question and answer process. Then you've got the other thing which is developing now in, and increasingly in the world, which is the stewardship and engagement process. And particularly for passive managers, and Legal in General was actually a pioneer in this as one of the world's, you know, Europe certainly, largest passive manager, running a lot of pension money. Right. In that way of using stewardship and engagement as a tool to get better results. Um, and that's a very formal process. In New Zealand now we've got the stewardship code and so th using the stewardship code, um, a fund manager will engage with the company by asking them to provide data um, and 
w you know, at times, if things are not going very well, they will then formally seek to engage with management and raise concerns and issues. So there are kind of two broad ways, really, that those large shareholders interact with companies. Right. It's, it's really interesting, and I'm glad you started with yeah. the director's duty, that the role of the board is to act in the best interest of the company, and the company is a separate legal entity from yes. the shareholders. The shareholders will only put money in the company if they're happy with where that company is going. Yes, yes. And the sorts of ways, as you say, that uh, the shareholders can uh, can interact with the company, you've got, of course, your annual meeting where they can stand up, they can yep. vote for the board members. Yep. Uh, larger shareholders may have the opportunity to independently or, or in small groups meet with the, yep. the board. And then, as you say, they're limited to the board are limited to say what's available in the public domain that's or anything right. that's said in that meeting has to be made available yes. to the public domain. Yes. So yeah. there are some, some issues tied up there and so ultimately yeah. a shareholder has the opportunity to vote with their money They do, by that's leaving. exactly right. Um, I think when there are issues that's when you will find the shareholder tends to be more vocal through that stewardship and engagement process. So for instance if there have been a series of issues usually on an ESG type um, framework, then they may seek a, me a meeting with the chair or a senior independent director because perhaps they've got concerns about the CEO. Right. Or they are, you know, looking, you know, they're, they're not happy and they will make their views more clear mm. in those sorts of scenarios. It'll be less about the Q&A and more about, you know, we, we're not happy with the way this company is going. Right. Or, yeah. Right. So. Um, of course, they can always write to the board as well, right? They, they can, can always write to the board, that's <coughs> right, or the company secretary or the chair directly, so yeah. You've alluded to this a little yeah. bit before. As ownership diffuses across a yeah. wider base, which particularly when you get into listed companies, you yes. end up with very diverse shareholders. You do. How can the board effectively engage with that, that wide base of shareholders? Yeah, so I think this is where a professional investor relations team is very, very helpful. You will also probably have brokers, and they'll be helpful. So you need to gather formally the insights um, what I would do when I was head of investor relations was gather the themes that were emerging from questions or topics that had been raised. I would also gather up the summaries from analyst notes and look at where there were themes. Um, all the brokers also were a source of feedback because right. a manager yes. might give them some information. Um, we obviously were running quarterly briefings um, and so you would also pick up um, comments um, and reporting in the media as well. So a very formal process of reporting that information up to the board and also looking at share price trends. I think the other bit of analysis that was important for us to understand was broadly the objectives of, of, the objectives of our shareholders. So you know you've got different types of shareholders, you've got your active shareholders, some of them maybe more in the income objective, they're running a big income fund, they're more interested in the stability of the dividend and hopefully it's growing, mm -hmm. versus the growth investor who's running a big growth fund who's looking to see has this company got the potential to grow over the five to ten year period, is there a strategy that's going to lead to that. Um, generally companies will often fall into one or either of those camps, but having said that even if you're an income stock, you should be considering how are you going to maintain this in the long run? Is it sustainable? So you still need a degree of development and innovation and growth and long-term shareholders will be looking for that. So you have to consider what are their goals um, and right. what are their objectives. And then of course you can have hedge fund managers as well and they might have very different objectives like shorting the stock. Um, so yeah, I think really getting on top of the base, understanding those objectives, and then providing the board with that insight. But remembering always that you you don't drive the company for necessarily any of those outcomes. You drive the company based on the strategy that's going to be best for those. Yes. Um, yeah. You, you've, you've alluded to a number of different voices, yeah. uh, particularly from larger shareholders. And as you yeah. suggest, you've got passive managers, you've got active managers, you've got yeah. those that are interested in growth, those that are interested in, in uh, value, yeah. of price stability and dividends, uh, and then your, your hedge fund managers yeah. as well. And those large investors can be vocal and, and have a stronger voice than a lot of the smaller shareholders. Yeah. So do the larger shareholders at any time individually, are there any, is there any subgroup that represents most of the shareholders effectively or are you trying to merge a whole bunch of voices and get I, themes I across? I think that's yeah. right. Generally you are because each fund manager is looking for their own advantage. They're looking to get the edge through having that private meeting. 
either of that sort of body language signal or whatever, however they get that edge. They're not really representing other shareholders in that. You do get groups like in New Zealand, we've got the New Zealand Shareholders Association, and I think that's really valuable in terms of helping small shareholders to, um, to have some representation and the opportunity also to be able to get insights and ask questions. Brokers and analysts are representing a hidden constituency. You won't always know who their constituency are, but they are also coming along and asking questions. Um, and you know, I think really most fund managers recognise that they are not professionals in running organisations. It's not what their skill set is. No. They are, they're there to um, make investment decisions fundamentally. So I think really when they get extremely vocal, it's when your company has got some serious and material environmental, social governance issues is when they start to get much more actively vocal and you, you will know that they're not happy. Um, right. Yeah. So moving the way that you get the balance yeah. between those large vocal shareholders and the, in many cases, larger, some cases a smaller yeah. minority of independent shareholders who together may have a voice with, as you say, an entity like the New Zealand Shareholders Association. It's about bringing all those voices in when you mm. can and then trying to represent yeah. everybody's interests. I think that's right. And I think nowadays with video meetings, you can open up a quarterly results briefing to a lot of people. Um, and you know, and you can capture questions on the chat, and you can record, and all of that enables you then to be able to do some analysis afterwards yeah, to sense right. the direction of yeah, of so sort of, of sentiment. This, some yeah. of the recent or not not most not so recent now technology really makes that possible. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. So how do you transfer these lessons that you've learned yep. over this experience to smaller companies? You yeah. know, when you've got shareholders, perhaps some venture capital, yep. you might have employee shareholders, so yep. you've got a mix. Uh, they tend to be have more, more involvement in many cases in the company, but you've also got silent investors as well. Yeah. How, do you, how do you transfer the lessons from your FTSE 100 yep. experience <laughs> to a smaller company? Well, I think you keep some of the same formality in that you, you keep the same discipline of providing the results to everybody at the same time, you know, through email, offering a meeting, whether it's by video and or in person to all of the shareholders. And in a smaller company, you will get a lot more of the smaller shareholders actually come. Right. Because as you say, perhaps they are employees, current or past. Um, you will have, you may well have a private equity or venture capital firm involved. It is more likely that they may even be on the board and, and that is probably where you do actually get more of that voice. But again, they are part of that collective board. So they're there still as the collective board directors to make sure the company's best interests and are being served. Um, what they, I think there is a real value, particularly in Aotearoa, from those entities because they are providing their global networks, they're providing inset, um, insights across other portfolio entities and maybe a sector experience. They may be helping an early stage company to kick up to the next level to access capital. So actually that's a pretty valuable role. There is just a need to be careful that they don't become too dominant and that, as you say, the needs of the minority shareholders are also being considered. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, yeah it, it is more of a balancing act and of course a lot of those minority shareholders will have really close insights because they're working in the business or still part of the same funnel. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Friends yeah. or family. Of Friends the or family. Found yeah. The yeah. 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 Well, um, thank you. That's yeah. that's really fascinating. Uh, I really appreciate your insights. I'm going to ask you one final yeah. question. What's the best governance advice you've received in your career? I think it is about trusting your instincts and really listening to your gut brain. So. You know, you're dealing with a lot of data as a director, and if you're not careful, you can get a bit lost in the data. You can also fall into a trap where management have served you up this data, and now you respond to it, and sometimes possibly at the wrong level as well, like a micro question. And I think what you need to do as a director is really allow yourself that time to let it distill in your brain, subconsciously as well as consciously, and kind of pull back and think about that bigger picture and is there something that's feeling off here? Is there an elephant in the room that collectively we're not addressing? Are we looking at the big strategic opportunities? 
are we thinking about strategic risks, but just what's my instinct? Yeah. I think that's really valuable. That, yeah. And also taking, I take from that, uh, you know, you read your board papers, do your homework. Yeah. Also take time to step back and yeah. consider again the company strategy where it's trying to head, the risks that are that are situated yeah. there, and then yes, trust that's trust your instinct. I like yeah. that. That's great. Thank yeah. you very much, Kate. Yeah. Thanks. Well, um, really enjoyed the conversation. <laughs> yeah, likewise. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, I'll thank look you forward again. to catching up again soon. Yeah, great. See you next episode. Okay, bye. Thank you for watching this episode of Governance Bites. We have more episodes on YouTube and your favorite podcast channel, where I interview directors and experts on various topics relating to boards of directors and governance. We'd love to see you back, and please like, subscribe, and share the videos and podcasts.